Thank you all for joining us today. I am your BCM host. I work for the BCM, the Board of Cooperative Ministries. I am the Special Projects Manager. Um, I'm Hannah Cheek Jackson, and um, I kind of do a variety of things, but kind of help with event coordination and that sort of things. One of my big jobs. Um, excuse me. Today we are going to talk all about church and copyright, um, which we have already almost 30 people on the call and I'm letting in more as we speak. So this is clearly very, very important. Um, today, our presenters are Gwen Michael from the Moravian Music Foundation, John Jackman, pastor and um, film creator. He is the pastor at Trinity Moravian and then Mike Reese, the executive director of IBOC. They all have a wealth of knowledge, knowledge on all things copyright. Um, and are going to be here to help answer your questions. If you have any questions throughout, just drop them in the chat and then at the end we'll do a question and answer period. Um, so I'll be keeping a tab on the chat and any questions in there. So I am going to go ahead and pass it over to Mike. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Or I think, yeah, I think everybody here is afternoon. Now we may have one or two mornings. Uh, now I see Aaron and, and Amy there. It's a, it is the morning there, as is with Megan. Um, I'm looking around the, the room here, and I, I noticed this too when I was looking at the at the list of the folks who are going to be here. I know almost all of you, which is a wonderful thing, and it's so good to see you all. It's been far so long uh, that that I've been uh, able to be with you all. Um, and I kind of wish that, that, you know, we were doing this at a church in Winston-Salem, but then I realized that a bunch of you wouldn't be there either. So it's, it's good to see you all. Um, we're going to talk about copyright today, and I'd like to give uh, my other two um, uh, presenters today an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, as Hannah said, I am Mike Reese. I'm the Executive Director of the Interprovincial Board of Communication, uh, IBOC for short. And uh, yeah, this year has been a crash course for me in copyright. Um, still learning new things all, you know, all the time, and we hope to be able to share uh, what we know with you uh, as we go through uh, today. Some of you sent questions in, which we hope we'll be able to answer as we go th through, and we hope to have an opportunity at the end of the session today to be able to share some more. So Gwen, introduce yourself, and then John, and then we'll get started. Sure. I'm Gwen Michael, the Assistant Director of the Moravian Music Foundation, and I'm based in Bethlehem. Where, yes, there is still snow on the ground, but it's melting. It's truly trying to melt. <laughs> so, and hopefully we can answer some of your music copyright questions today. John? Yeah, I'm John Jackman. I'm a pastor of Trinity Moravian Church in Winston-Salem, but my, my other life, I'm a filmmaker. And uh, so over the years, uh, just as uh, survival in that uh, weird business. I paid a lot of lawyers a lot of money to walk me through the details of uh, the copyright stuff I was involved in. And I'd echo what Mike said. Yeah, we, this has been a crash course this year for all of us because what we're doing is doesn't fit cleanly in a nice slot in the copyright law. Uh, so that's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike. Hey, yeah, if you want to call it exciting, okay. Uh, uh, Calling. <laughs> sleep losing, I think, is a is a good one there too. So, but but again, we've got some we've got some good information for you today, and we hope that we answer answer your questions. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and hopefully, y'all are seeing my PowerPoint presentation. Yes. I can't, if someone could say yes, because I can't see you once I do that, I can't see that. Yes. That you're, okay, good, thank you, thank you. Um, so we are here to talk about the Circle C, um, copyright. Um, this is a graphic actually I created about, uh, about eight years ago to illustrate a story that we did on uh, introducing the guidelines for uh, Moravian Church uh, copyright use. Um, and I found every font I possibly could to make a Circle C. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. Again, we're going to be talking about uh, understanding the Circle C, copyright, and the church. We already introduced our presenters. We have Gwen, John, and myself. So we're going to start with a couple of definitions um, to, to give you an idea of, of what we're going to be talking about today. First of all, the definition for copyright. And copyright is the exclusive legal right given to an originator or an assignee to print, publish, perform, film, or record literary, artistic, or musical material 
and to authorize others to do the same. I think there's more commas in that sentence than one that I've ever seen before. But if you, if you boil all, it all down, essentially copyright is just that, the right to copy. Um, it, it, it's the, the you own, if, if you hold the copyright in something, you are the sole per per person who has the right to copy that without asking for permission, okay? Um, original creators and only those they authorize are the ones that, that have exclusive rights to reproduce a work. Um, essentially, if you didn't create it and it's not in the public domain, someone likely owns the rights to reproduce and use and you need to license or get permission to use it if you're going to share it in any way, okay? Um, what can be copyrighted? Words, you know, books, um, uh, song lyrics, uh, liturgies as, as we have them, uh, images, um, both, both artistic and photographic, music of all sorts, video, and recordings. Um, now, I will make a, a note here that you'll see uh, you know, um, images throughout this presentation. These are ones that either I've created myself or I have, I have um, uh, the rights to. So these are things that, that um, it's amazing what you can do by laying stuff on your desk and taking pictures of them. But these are all images uh, that, that, uh, that I've, I've created or I've used. Um, but again, these are the types of things that, that copyrights typically, typically cover. Now there's also public domain. And public domain essentially is creative materials not protected by intellectual property laws, things like copyright or trademark or things like that. Essentially, the public owns public domain works. And what that means is anyone can use these materials without obtaining um, permission. Uh, materials enter the public domain when copyrights expire. Um, there, are, you know, there's there's a lot of different. Um, dates and things like that as to when things, uh, copyrights expire. Sometimes it's the author's, uh, you know, after the author's death for 70 years afterwards, or um, there's a bunch of other, other ways that they happen and they keep changing every year. But when copyrights expire, they go into the public domain. Um, materials can also be intentionally you know, uh, placed in the public domain so that if someone creates something they want the world to share it uh, and want the world to see it and use it, they can intentionally put it in the public domain or when it's no longer copyrighted, uh, protected by copyright law. There are certain things that, that you can't copyright. Um, you know, facts cannot be copyrighted. Um, so when they're, they're not uh, covered by copyright law, they're in the public domain. Now there's a third um, thing that I wanted to talk about. It's called the worship exemption. And this is what's made uh, being able to, to use materials in worship um, uh, the kind of thing that you can do anytime you want. Um, the copyright code essentially says that you, as, as, a, as a church, um, you're free to use performance of non-dramatic literary or musical work or of a dramatic new musical nature. I love these, these terms that they, they use with the copyright code. Um, or display of, the, of a work in the course of services at a place of worship or other religious assembly. And that comes from the US Copyright Code section 110, um, uh, paragraph three, limitations on exclusive rights, exemptions on certain performances or displays. So essentially what this says is congregations can perform and sing most pieces in worship services held in their churches. So this has made it, you know, easy for, for us to be able to perform, uh, you know, even copyrighted pieces of music, um, to be able to, uh, to show images on, you know, or display things in churches. Um, but there are certain things that, that where there, this is limited. Um, this is only in the course of a religious service. Does not include events outside of worship, uh, outside of worship. So this is not for your picnics or your, your, your uh, you can't do a concert with things like this. This, this doesn't apply to that. Um, and it only exempts performance and display in your building. It doesn't cover things like streaming or distributing things, reproducing, um, printing or projecting, uh, adapting or recording. So the only thing it really covers is performance of these of these uh, pieces, but not uh, pretty much not anything else. This is why you've typically had a CCLI license or a one license license in your church now, so that you can project things, you can um, put the lyrics in your bulletin, uh, things like that. Um, so that's why, you know, up until most of us started um, figuring out a way to share our services online, that we could do pretty much what we wanted to in our churches and not really have to worry too, too much about it. Um, streaming changes everything. 
Um, as, as, as many of you have found out over the last year, that when you go online, um, suddenly everything that you knew about copyright and being able to do stuff in your worship, and, and sometimes it's taking the creativity out of it, it streaming just changed everything uh, for what we're doing. So first of all, it adds layers of complexity and work to planning and delivering worship services. We know this, um, you know, suddenly uh, you didn't have to work, you, you know, it used to be you, you just needed to worry about what was going to happen in your church building. Now you've got to figure out how you're going to get it online, how you're going to share it with people, what are you going to do, how are you going to make sure you've got all the proper licensing in, in place and things like that. Um, the worship exemption pretty much no longer applies once you put something online. Um, I, I, I liken it to, to um, to uh, a broadcast. So um, you can listen to something in your house, but once you broadcast it, um, then copyright comes into play. It's the same sort of thing with, with what we're doing with church. Mike, um, let, me, yes. let me chime in there just for okay. clarity. Okay. Uh, under copyright law, when you put something on YouTube or uh, make it available to people publicly on Facebook or wherever, you become a broadcaster. Uh, in the in the definition of the law so churches become broadcasters and we come under all the laws that would apply to television stations mm -hmm. so you know i've joked and I, I i i i maybe it's not so funny anymore but um all of our pastors have become televangelists over the last you know the last uh, year um and uh and you know fortunately they're not all jim bakers but but um the, the fact is, as John said, once you, once you put something on YouTube or on Facebook, you become a broadcaster and everything changes. So it increases the focus on copyright and permissions for all you're doing, and it requires additional licensing. Quite simply, streaming raises many questions. We know this, and I got a bunch of great questions from folks uh, coming into today's, uh, today's session. So we're gonna start with a couple of these, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask the question, and then I'm going to, to pop off and uh, the three of us are going to work on answering them for you. Um, the first one is, do I need a license to use public domain hymns or liturgies? This is actually, the, I think, a, a good place to start. Uh, no, you don't. Um, if you're using materials that are in the public domain, you don't need to have any sort of license or anything like that to be able to stream these and share these. Um, with some caveats, these are things that you perform or say yourself. Um, but if you're using someone else's recording of a public domain piece, then yes, you have to get a license. Then you have to get, uh, then you have to be able to do that. But the the best place to start if you're just starting out with with doing this kind of thing and you don't have any of your licenses yet, is to look for public domain resources to be able to do that. Okay. Oh. Now this is a question that we got from a lot of folks. If it's in the Moravian Book of Worship, why do I need to get permission to use things? Quite frankly, there's a lot of good stuff in the, in the Book of Worship that is public domain. But when the Book of Worship was put together back in, in the early 90s, um, no one had any idea this was going to be what we're going to be looking at. Um, we have uh, quite a few um, copyrighted pieces within uh, the Book of Worship, simply because it expands our ability uh, and our, 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 our worship um, to be able to have these kinds of pieces uh, in, in the Book of Worship. But just because they're in the Book of Worship, we don't have the rights to let you say you can use them however you want to. They're not in public domain that way. The copyright holders that you see at the bottom of a hymn or as part of a liturgy, those are the folks that still own this uh, material, and they are the ones that need to be checked with before you can use it. You know, we, we used to, before everybody was streaming, we would get, you know, one or two requests a week from folks saying, how do I get a hold of the copyright holder on this hymn because we wanna be able to project it or we wanna be able to print it in our bulletin. That, those are the kinds of things that we dealt with in the past. Just because it's in the book of worship does not mean that it can be something that, that, um, that you can just automatically use without um, permissions. Just to put it in historical context for those that might not be as old as I am, uh, we, uh, the, the internet, the web was brand new, uh, while the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, book of worship was being compiled. We created the first Moravian.org in 1994. So I think that was the same year that the, uh, book of worship was being printed. And we had, at that time, nobody had any conception 
of what we'd be doing now. I was going to say the, um, um, yeah, the, the Book of Worship came out in 1995. So yes, you're right. This was, that was way before any of this. CCLI didn't appear until I think 1998 was the first time we heard yeah. Howard Prusinski. And, but so all of this, uh, yeah, the, what you have, the Blue Book of Worship came into play long before any of this. And if you've got the Book of Worship in your sanctuaries, which I think all, all of you do, most of you do, what uh, possession of that book of worship gives you the right to pick up the hymnal during your church service on a Sunday morning and use it. Period. <laughs> so, and so, so any any reproduction of any copyrighted materials within the book of worship and anything that would be streamed or broadcast, that's the stuff you need a license for. Right. This is pretty uh, pretty standard fare for for most denominational um, um, hymnals. You'll find this if you look at the the Presbyterian hymnal or the the one from the UMC. They're all pretty much the same. They don't grant blanket permission to use the materials however you want to in worship. They're essentially there, as as Gwyn said, to be able to pick up and sing from. Um, and uh, and so, um, in a in a dream world, it would have been you know wonderful if there and. Uh, Hopefully some, someday we'll figure out how to do this, that we can get blanket for all of what's in there. But there are so many different copyright holders uh, and so many different um, uh, entities that we would have to work with to make that possible. Um, plus the publishers really aren't, aren't into doing that. Um, they prefer to, to get the royalties that they normally would, or they've got things in place right now where the licenses that they have or the licensees that they have um, gets them what they need to whenever they need it. So, um, all right, next question we're gonna cover here. Oh, I went, I clicked too quickly. Hold on, there we go. All right, all right. So do I need to have permission to stream music, share text or show images? Um, the answer is maybe, yes and no. Uh, what we did was we built a chart um, and we're still working on this. So this, this we, we may tweak this as we go along, but we built a chart that would help us walk through some of the, the instances of, of um, where you'd be um, or what you would need to be able to do um, to be able to use materials. So we look down the left-hand side here, um, we have our media. These are different different media that you'd be using in church. And then a couple of different things up on, or actually four, a couple is only two. Uh, in church worship, in church projection. So this is if you're putting it up on a big screen, um, bulletin printing and distribution, and if you're streaming your service, okay? So if we look at the first one, uh, public domain hymn, um, essentially okay to use right across the board. Um, you can, you can um, use it in your worship, you can project it on your screen, you can print it in your bulletin, and you can also use it in a streaming service. When we get to copyrighted, um, then things started to get a little, a little more dicey. Okay, in church worship, again, you're welcome to use it. Uh, in church projection, you have to have a, what's called a print license. Um, there's a couple of different licenses that we'll talk about in a little bit that um, folks like uh, CCLI and one license offer. Um, so the in-church projection and the bulletin printing and distribution, those are with a print license, okay? Once you want to start streaming it, you have to get what's called a streaming or a podcast license. So it's an additional license on top of, actually you can, you can separate them, but, but most folks have their print license and then they tack on the streaming and podcast license. If we're looking at um, Moravian Book of Worship liturgies, um, the, the public domain with, with public domain hymns, again, they're okay pretty much across the board. You have permission from the Interprovincial Board of Communication to be able to share those liturgies from the, the Book of Worship, as long as there's no copyrighted hymns within them, pretty much however you want to. We've granted permission for you to be able to, be able to do that. If you're using a Book of Worship liturgy with hymns, again, this with copyrighted hymns, this is where things uh, get a little dicey. We have um, um, uh, the, the liturgies that we have that have no copyrighted hymns are all now available for download from moravian.org. You can download the, the texts that you'll be able to use in slides or however you want to use them online. Um, but once those, those um, liturgies have copyrighted hymns in them, we can't post them with the hymns in them, because that's, again, that, that goes, we don't have the, the proper license to do that. And if you wanna be able to use those to project in church or to, to distribute the, in your bulletin or as a streaming service, you need to have the licenses to do that. Now I will say 
that if your church, you know, lets us know that you have the proper licenses to be able to share those, we can send you the text. So if you need a hand making your slide, you'll be able to do that. Um, I'm gonna, the, these next two are actually gonna have Gwen talk a little bit about um, the uh, prelude and post music and vocal so solos and choral anthems. Um, so Gwen, do you wanna work through those? Sure, yeah, um, obviously with in-person in worship, it's fine. Um, and any of those would be fine. Prelude, postlude music, service music, vocal solos, choral anthems, it would be fine. If you want to print any of the texts in your bulletin, I'm skipping over to column three. If you want to print any of the texts in your bulletin, you need permission to do that. And that, uh, if it's uh, can be covered, on, sometimes could be covered under CCLI or one license, depending upon the text used. Uh, same thing with in church projection. You would need you would need to have licensing to do that. Um, in terms of streaming and podcasts, unfortunately, there's no um, there's there's no blanket license that covers service music or uh, vocal solos and choral anthems at the moment. Uh, would that CCLI and one license did? Uh, they don't not yet. Uh, the one thing that is out there, though, uh, with prelude and postlude music is there is a separate license called Worship Cast License, which is available through Christian Copyright Solutions, which is kind of a stepchild of CCLI. And um, that has an expanded database that includes uh, materials from ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Um, so, um, and I know a number of our church musicians have been using the worship cast license, and so they do get coverage there. Um, yeah. A little later when we talk about the differences between CCLI and one license, uh, we will share some information we have about uh, anthems, uh, but it is very much a one thing at a time uh, thing with anthems. And I'll, the way one of the publishers explained it to me is that often these anthems have passed through several ownerships. Uh, companies have merged, you know, it's, it's not real clear uh, that, or it, it is clear legally, but it's confusing who actually can say what about a specific anthem. And so in many cases um, uh, with anthems that we've used at Trinity, um, they kind of have to go back and see who actually has the right to say, yes, it can be used. And, and there's times they come back and say, you know, we are distributing it, but we don't have the right to get to do streaming uh, license. So it's, it's very much a one piece at a, a time, which is as inconvenient as it could possibly be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I was going to say, so with choral anthems, you really, I, I, my viewpoint is you need to go back to the publisher to ask permission. But as John just said, it's hard to determine who that publisher is anymore sometimes. And even when you do find that publisher, trust me, as someone who used to work for a number of different publishers, um, they don't always know that they own it. So, <laughs> so you've got you to point that out to them, but that, that, is, that is where I would start, so. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, you know, again, one thing that, that, that um, we need to keep in mind is that um, copyright is how, um, and royalties are how musicians and composers, um, uh, writers, that's, that's how they make their living. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we can't, we can't just say, well, they're doing it for the church. Well, yeah, they might be, but at the same time, this is how they make their living. Um, so we can't begrudge these folks, uh, for getting the proper licenses and paying for the proper licenses because yeah. we want folks to continue creating music. We want folks to, you know, to continue creating great uh, works of, of photography or of, of written word. Uh, the only way that can happen is if they get paid for it. And this is how this, is how this all happens. Yeah, I have a sort of rule personally. I don't ask somebody to donate their service to the church if it is the way they make their living. Uh, you know, we don't ask organists to play regularly uh, for free just because it's for the church. It's how they live. And, you know, the Bible says the worker deserves his pay or her pay, so. And I would, I would just add to that in terms of the uh, licensing agencies, they, um, I am not sure what their cut is of, of all of the streaming, but I can tell you it's negligible. 
It is negligible. Yeah. The <laughs> CCLI, I mean, I, I, I don't want to go off on this. CCLI was a, a way to print money. Uh, they keep an enormous chunk of what you pay them. And the, the end, uh, the actual creative people get the very short end of the stick. And that's just the way it is. Well, publishers don't get don't get paid a lot, so I, I no, that's I you know the publishers. <laughs> no, that's right. It's the the licensing people and the lawyers that are involved. They keep a good chunk of the money, but it's how we do things. All right, let's talk. There's a couple of other pieces we want to talk about here. Again, um, images and artwork. Uh, again, if you're if you're if you're displaying them in in, in worship. Um, you're pretty much okay. But otherwise, you need to get licenses or permissions to be able to do that. That's if they're copyrighted. If you find images that either you take yourself uh, or they're taken in your church or, or taken by someone in your church and they give you permission to use, you're good to go. Um, there are also uh, sites out there where you can get um, images that uh, don't have a copyright to them or they're free to be able to use. Um, one thing I often recommend to churches is that if you want to do use uh, images for your PowerPoint presentations or for your projections or things like that, have a photographer in your church, start taking pictures of your church. You'd be amazed. Uh, even the simplest church um, can create some really beautiful uh, imagery of what they've got lying around the church. It's great stuff. Uh, video, again, video is, is one of those where you really need to, to look at where you're getting it. For the most part, you wanna to try to find permission or license uh, video. Video is one of those that, that you can't just, um, you know, show a movie clip in, in, uh, in your service, especially if you're projecting it or streaming it. Um, so you need to be kind of careful with that. With music recordings, though, from what I understand, it's okay to play a song in, 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 in worship. Um, but um, uh, if, you're, if you're going to be distributing it in any way, uh, right. say you're going to be uh, do, making DVDs for your, your shut-ins or something like that, if folks still do that, um, or if you're going to be streaming it, you need to have permission or, or a license. Um, someone posted a question about outdoor worship. Is that covered? And the answer is yes. Uh, <clears throat> it's not uh, whether or not it's indoors or outdoors. It's the context of a legitimate worship service that brings about the um, exemption. Um, so it, you know, we're a, a lot of us have been doing some worship outside. Same exemption applies. Uh, however, um, uh, how can, how shall I say this? I had a couple of people approach me and say, well, we wanna do this and it doesn't fit over the worship exemption. So what if we kind of pretend that it's worship? Um, I will tell you that a judge would not look kindly on that. <laughs> uh, there, there have been people trying to figure out how to skirt some of these things for a long time and the courts have not been friendly to those. Um, so uh, it, it needs to be a legitimate worship service as uh, where you know, people come together uh, and you're doing what you normally do in worship not something you pretend is worship because you wanted to do a concert. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks, John. Okay. So next up, uh, how do I reliably find out if something is public domain? So most published modern creative works will be copyrighted. It's just that simple. Uh, if it's something that people want to be able to use, there it's going to have a copyright. It'll have a, a circle C on it um, and the, the copyright holder's information. If you look, for example, just for example, in the, the Moravian Book of Worship, at the base of every copyrighted hymn, there is a circle C with a date and who owns the copyright on that and what, what rights have been, been assigned. Um, so, um, you know, most modern public uh, works or creative works um, will be copyrighted. Things in the public domain, uh, first of all, most works published before 1925, now, not all, but most published before 1925 um, will be considered public domain. Um, that's, you know, start, starting to get to be that point where, um, you know, the author plus the age and, and those kind of rules, um, you know, if it was done before 1925, you can pretty much be sure that it's, it's public domain, uh, but you still need to check. Um, uh, also, you can, I mean, some pieces will actually say, you know, you have permission to use, or this is in the public domain, or there's no copyright statement to it. However, I will say, assume it's copyrighted unless you can determine otherwise. So if you're looking at using a, a, a piece of music or a liturgy or, or, you know, a book or something like that, assume that it's copyrighted unless you can determine otherwise. Um, and if you aren't sure uh, and you're, you're concerned about using it, just use something else. 
Um, I know that that sounds cavalier, uh, but if you think about it, um, you know, if you can't show, if you can't um, determine whether or not something is copyrighted, but dollars to donuts, it probably is if it's younger than 1925. Um, and if oh, you aren't older. sure, use something else. What yeah, I say, if it's older than 1925. Yeah, if it's younger than 1925, more than likely it is copyrighted, is right. what I meant to say. So assume it's copyrighted, yes. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, how do I get permission to use copyrighted materials in my worship? Well, that's what we're going to talk a little bit, uh, quite a bit about today, actually. Um, and so getting permission, the first thing you can do is contact the publisher or the creator of the work that you want to use for <clears throat> permission. Um, this is the sort of the long way around it. Um, but every copyrighted piece has some way of getting in touch with the person who created it or the, the whoever owns the rights. Be very specific with your request and how you're going to be using it. A lot of uh, publishers and, and music publishers have websites where you can go to and just fill in a form and talk about what permissions you're looking for. Be very specific with what you're looking for. Um, you can purchase license or rights. So sometimes you can just get permission from, from someone to be able to use their work. Um, I found that that over the last uh, year or so, I've reached out to to um, certain folks who've written hymns who gladly said, yes, you have my permission to use this piece, didn't charge me anything for it. The other side is that when uh, we wanted to use some hymns in one of our, our Moravian Church Without wa uh, Walls services, we actually went and purchased the rights to be able to use that, uh, the, the hymns that we wanted to use, one time or special uses of materials. And the third way is to get a blanket license, uh, a CCLI or one license. You've heard us throw those terms around. We're going to talk about those in just a minute. So if you're looking to get permission to be able to use a piece of, of music or a liturgy or, or an image or, or a sound recording or whatever, these are some of the things that you'd want to look at to be able to do that. Okay. All right. Um, how do I choose between CCLI and one license or something else? I mean, there's other ways of doing that. And I'm going to throw this one open now to, to Gwen and to John uh, to talk about. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> so there are two, um, there are two kind of basic um, uh, licensing agencies for our, that, uh, that work best for our use. Uh, one is CCLI, one is one, uh, one license. Mike, we, could you bring up the CCLI um, screen, please? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, and um, I, find, I think the difference in my brain is uh, CCLI has more contemporary Christian oriented materials and uh, one license has more liturgically oriented materials. Uh, so that's how I kind of differentiate. Um, uh, yes, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, so this is a home page at, oh, this is a streaming page at CCLI. Um, can you, Mike, can you back up to, um, to the, uh, what we provide? Yeah, what we provide. And uh, so if you scroll down, uh, then there's a screen that covers a little bit further. It covers uh, print, uh, it covers print and all this. It's, uh, it contains more than 500,000 songs from 3,000 publishers. So the general licensing covers print and uh, within, within your worship service. Now keep in mind, both of these, both CCLI and One License are congregationally oriented. So uh, CCLI, uh, they, they both cover hymns or worship songs, mainly for congregational use. And this is why we said when we're talking about choral anthems or vocal solos, that it's not always covered under either of these licenses. So um, anyway, there is, if you, if you go a little further down the page, uh, Mike, there's pricing at the bottom of the page. Um, that I think lays things out. Well, well, it was at the bottom of my page. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Go back to pricing. Yeah. So song select. Uh, CCLI has different. It, it, yes, here we are on the song select page. I will say that CCL ha has different levels. There's the basic congregational level, which we, uh, which allows you to print the lyrics within your bulletin. 
There is another level called Song Select, which will allow you to do um, to do more to create um, create your own, not create your own arrangements, but but transpose the music, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and that's very helpful. There we are. Thank you. Uh, that's that's very helpful um, if if especially if you have a worship ensemble within your church, uh, because it uh, you can. Uh, Print out. Um, you can print out copies. Of, you can print out uh, parts for any of your worship leaders. It, you can print um, uh, a choral score, etc. So yeah. Uh, Gwen, 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 let, let me chime in. And, you know, <laughs> uh, people are having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Um, so uh, you may need to speak up, and when you turn your face away, they're not hearing you. So, okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. How about now? Um, okay, so here we are at, um, anyway, so the, li the license, on the left-hand side, you see the license, and it's, it's based on congregational, um, not congregational size, but attendance. Uh, yes, thank you, on the left-hand side. And so, um, and for instance, um, uh, my church would be a level B, and base cost for the license is two, 235 a year. Uh, to add the streaming license is $73, only $73, which I think is, is just a gift, actually. Um, it's not much at all. So, um, so that's, that's kind of a general layout for CCLI. If you want to go to one license, thank you. Uh, we've got the same thing right there. You've got um, the annual license and fee costs. Uh, again, level, uh, my church here would be a level C. C. Um, so the basic cost would be $300. If you add the streaming, it's, it's 105. And uh, sometimes people say that, that the licensing seems expensive, that it's more than they can afford. And my answer is generally, it, you can't afford not to have it if uh, you're going to use copyrighted materials in, in your worship service. Um, so, uh, and as, as I say, they both, um, they both offer, um, it's generally the same offer and they're all based on, on attendance, not congregational size. It's just a matter of what type of music does your church congregation normally use. Um, uh, one license, for instance, covers uh, a lot of Lutheran hymns. It covers Taizé. Um, and, and as I say, CCLI is more contemporary Christian oriented. Um, in my congregation, we have both because we use both, um, both forms of songs within our worship service normally. And, um, and that's just what we need. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Um, the, the, the difference actually, if you sit down and look, if you just go search on some, some songs you want to use, uh, you can pretty quickly find out how different the two are. Um, CCLI really does lean toward what I call top 40 uh, Christian radio music uh, to, to stuff that uh, you have a rock band perform together up in front and, you know, they, they've got a lot of stuff like that. The uh, more traditional stuff, um, which uh, there's a lot in our hymnal, for instance, uh, comes under one license. And um, when I'm going to just have a, a bias here, I, I vastly prefer dealing with one license. Our congregation has both because we found that we really needed both. Um, and an example is um, the Liturgy of Creation uh, uses um, what, uh, him, God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale, which if I recall, I'm, I may be wrong on who's got what, but I think one license has that, CCLI does not. And then on the next page, we have as the deer pants, pants for the water, which is vice versa. And so you cannot, you cannot do the liturgy of creation in your church and webcast it without both CCLI and one license. Um, someone had asked about um, a, additional licensing, and we can talk about that in a little bit, the uh, Ask at BMI. That's that's more in the realm of what you would play for 
prelude, prelude and postlude, and Gwen can talk a little bit about that license. For, for the most part, in our uh, um, normal Moravian worship service, CCLI and one license together are going to cover it. Um, and so if you decide you can only afford one, uh, for Moravian churches, I would just tell you, take a serious look at one license. And there's a couple other reasons why that I'll articulate in a minute. But, um, and, but then you have the choice of, well, what do we do with the, the liturgy of creation? Uh, do we drop this hymn out? Do we substitute something else? Um, you just have to make some decisions about what you're going to actually do in your worship service. Mike, do you want to bring up uh, the worship cast? Sure. Okay. Too many screens, not enough time. Okay. I know, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so, uh, and so yeah, so there's the worship cast. And you can see uh, this has substantially more songs, 28 million Christian and secular songs. So this this broadens the base substantially, and and this worship cast license is the one that adds a uh, keyboard can can add keyboard um, capabilities. Um, it's set up the same way in terms of congregational size. If you go to the bottom page, um, and yeah, there you see it. But it is a separate license. So for each license, you're you're paying you're paying what is shown there. Um, and, uh, and in terms of, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, please, Mike. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. What songs are covered by the worship cast license? Can you click on that? Yeah. Yep. There you go. Uh, so uh, Christian and secular songs from the combined catalogs of ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. So that's the good thing is they have all of the, all of the, uh, 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 performance agencies under one umbrella. So, um, so that's helpful. Um, as I say, I know a number of, of church musicians who are using this now. Um, they found that it covers some of the materials covered by CCLI. I would be surprised if it covers a lot that's covered right. by one license. I would yeah. be surprised. I don't use this one, so I can't, I can't uh, speak to it uh, personally, but I can put you in touch with some people who do. So. Um, so that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the anthems for a minute, since we're talking about the different um, differences between CCLI and one license. And uh, to me as a pastor, this is this area is very important. This is one of the details that uh, I'm going to make a decision <laughs> about which one to go with. Um, we have, uh, with as far as choral anthems, for I'll, I really try to do things right. So before the pandemic, you know, we've been webcasting for about ten years. So we we would go and we'd call uh, publishers and say, "Is it okay for us to sing this anthem and webcast?" And actually, we we stopped doing that after a while because none of them cared very much, and there was no particular system set up to, to buy a license to do that. So most of them said, yeah, sure, don't bother about it. Make sure you put the copyright information at the bottom and we're fine with it. Well, the pandemic started and now everybody's online and it suddenly became a really serious issue. So I have approached, I, I, I went in our music library and I actually pulled a whole bunch of anthems by random and, uh, randomly and, and made a list of publishers and we've been working through contacting every one of them. All the publishers that have gotten back to me have had the same response that we should just go and report the use through CCLI or one license. Uh, and that's the system they seem to be working up to being part of. I don't know that it's all finalized yet. The problem there is if you have something that is not listed on CCLI, there is no mechanism to report something. One license, has a mechanism and an entire department dedicated to uh, going to the publisher and, and getting your that covered, um, which to me is terrific. So um, with any, any anthem that we do not find covered on one license, I can report to one license. They are probably signatory with the publisher. They may not have that particular uh, thing in the roster 
But in most cases so far, they've been able to go to the publisher and the publisher said fine. And they just added on as one more little check mark for uh, a payment. Um, and uh, there will probably come a day when they'll get back to me and say, oops, sorry, we can't give you permission for that. And then we'll have to decide, do we take that down? Do we eliminate it? What do we do with it? But um, I, I'm very pro one license because of that, because there is that deeper flexibility in reporting both anthems and uh, hymns that aren't aren't necessarily listed. Um, I don't, did I now Gwen? When Gwen's talking about the other stuff, uh, the instrumental stuff before and after, um, that's not covered at all by these these two licenses that we're talking about. That's where you need to go to the uh, worship license that covers ASK ASK at BMI. Um, and it is if you looked at the prices, it is significantly more expensive than the others. So that's for most of our churches, that's going to be a major decision barrier. So. That's correct. <laughs> and, and know that, that I mean, again, we feel for you. We understand how difficult this uh, is to, to try to navigate um, and how it can, can quash the, the creativity you might have in your worship planning. Um, at the same um, time, go ahead, yeah. John. I'm sorry, well, I meant to, to say while we're here and we're talking about the different licenses, um, let me go off in another tangent and, and mention video and film. Um, CCLI a number of years ago came up with the Christian video license, uh, which is CVLI. Uh, and that's a blanket license uh, that, that um, allows you to play Disney films and so on and so on and so on. Um, it's not terribly expensive uh, for a lot of our congregations is 100, 100 to $200 a year. Um, I really strongly recommend that every church have that license um, because you know that we, you know you're showing Disney stuff to the kids in nursery. I mean, it just happens. Um, and uh, uh, so that way you're covered. The, the downside of that is that most Christian independent films are not covered by that because uh, it's it's uh, the the little get pot guys get such a small piece of the pie it's not worth it. Um, when we released my film Wesley, uh, we took a look at at licensing with CVLI, and I think we figured out that we would get between forty five and fifty dollars a year because the big slices of the pie go to Disney, they go to Warner, they go to Fox. And there's not much left over. So most of the independent Christian films that you can name are not covered by CVLI and need to have a separate license when you show them in church. So. And, yeah. Can, thank you, John. Can, I'm going to back up um, also to uh, the prelude postlude question because Nola just put a comment in the in the chat box, and and I was going to say so. Um, She's right. She said, might encourage our, our musicians to return to the 18th century Moravian practice of using a hymn as a prelude and postlude. I will say that, uh, yeah, uh, I've been doing a lot of public domain material. So my congregation has been hearing a lot of uh, public domain and Moravian Music Foundation material. And so my congregation has been hearing a lot of MMF and a lot of Baroque. So. <laughs> They, Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but another thing, and let me, let me chime in, in another avenue that uh, um, one of the things I'm blessed uh, with at Trinity is to have a number of very creative folks in the congregation whom I've tried to nurture. Uh, and we've had, uh, we actually had some hymn writing workshops and so on that went on. So, you know, we're having original music that's coming up um in our congregation that all i have to do is pick up the phone and ask the person who wrote it can we sing this on sunday uh and and that is terrific and uh, the energy that that has for the congregation to feel like our own june edwards or uh, whoever wrote this uh or in the larger moravian sphere when you use something that was written by another moravian that you knew at camp or that you met uh, somewhere uh, boy, there's some energy in that, 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 you know, that, that this came from somebody we know, um, and much more than the, I would say the radio stuff and the top 40 Christian stuff. And, and let me, let me say, we've been talking about the book of worship, but there are, there is also 
Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Sing to the Lord a new song, the, the still new Moravian songbook. And um, everything in that is Moravian. Uh, some, uh, it's all either new text with old hymns, new tunes with old text, or new everything. And, um, and a lot of the material in there is either owned by IVOC and, and MMF. And for those materials, we give you permission. Some of them are newly written, newly composed music or texts, and we have contacts for all of those people and, and can easily put you in touch with them if you would like to use their materials as part of your worship service as well. And I know they would be thrilled to have you do that, but you need to get their permission. I, I see I see Chris Johnson nodding her head. She's got a number of pieces in here. Yes, so essentially yes. when, when we're talking about about sing to the Lord, uh, if you see down at the bottom the you know copyright um, you know IBOC or Moravian Music Foundation, that means you can use it. You don't you don't have to contact us. We're we're happy to have you use it. If it's got a, a name next to it, a copyright name, simply send them an email. And the, they're all in the back of the book here. Um, and um, most times they'll just say yes, thank you. We're glad you're using it. Mm -hmm. um and uh and so there there are there are plenty now I, I will also again i'm just going to make a make a plug for what we've been working on 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 moravian.org is being able to provide as as much public domain material for folks to be able to use in their worship services as possible um gwen and i right now are working on with with a number of other people working on recording public domain hymns um that that you'll be able to play in your worship um, we put the, the words and the music for, for what we have public domain wise up online. All of the public domain liturgies we have available there for you now. Um, now, the, the recordings will be will have a, a copyright to them because we're making them. But again, if you're a Moravian congregation, please use the materials that we have available online for you to be able to, 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 to grab and use. Um, I'll, I'd, uh, if you haven't been using the new songbook, um, you know, at least get one copy. I believe we were, Trinity was the first congregation to buy a full set of copies for everybody in church. We adopted it enthusiastically. Uh, and we've had a, a kind of uh, continued roll up of creativity from that. Um, the one song, We Have Come From Foreign Lands, uh, inspired my music director so much that he then created an anthem, a choral anthem based on that. Uh, you know, so. Uh, new juice and creative juice is great. Mike is muted. You're muted. Mike is muted. <laughs> You're on now. Wow, you, see, I thought you were able to read lips. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, um, I'm going to hop back into the presentation. And then we're going to talk. We're going to uh, open the floor up for some of the questions that we're getting uh, through the chat, getting some really good questions in there. When I'm on the presentation, I can't see those. So I've been copying and pasting them as other folks have been talking. Um, so we'll try to get to some of those in just a minute because we do want to make sure that we get there. OK, um, so do I need a standard license or a streaming license? Um, we've talked quite a bit about this, but standard license is if you're you're doing pretty much stuff within your your church. Uh, if you're printing music or lyrics, if you're projecting music uh, or lyrics, but this is really for in church or for worship only. Um, it's where you need the streaming podcast licenses whenever you start streaming it onto some sort of technical or online um, service. Be that Zoom, be that YouTube, be that Facebook. If you're if you're sharing these materials as part of an online service. Um, or you're playing or performing these copyrighted hymns as part of your online service. Even if you're posting it to your, your social media or you're recording and you're putting it on your website, you need one of these streaming and podcast licenses to cover you. Um, that's what they're there for. Um, they also give you the, you know, if, if, if you look at the different, the, the, the different companies, you'll also see they give you the opportunity to be able to share the lyrics on screen, to be able to, to, uh, to archive stuff. Some of them are even working on, on um, getting performance tracks that you're able to use. So the, the industry is starting to shift, it's starting, starting to change, starting to get a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, helpful in terms of, of making this stuff work for you. Um, but, but again, the, the, your standard CCLI or one license license is really designed for in-church worship or for, for printing those kinds of things, where it's the streaming and podcast license that you really need to go for uh, to get those other things. And again, you know, if you look at, if you look at the one license the, and look at the CCLI, the, the add-on license for the streaming and podcast licenses are not, yes, they cost money, but they're, they're not, none of our churches are 15,000 church, you know, seat churches um, or, or average attendance. 
Um, so the, 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 the costs are, they're there, but they're, they're not exorbitant and they open you up to all kinds of uh, material that you're able, that you are able to use. Okay. Um, now let's come back here. All right. Um, so one thing I'd like to share now is how do, how do I share How do I share that I have permission or license to use copyrighted materials? Um, there's a there's a chart that I got from uh, from one license that sort of lays this out. Um, that when you're when you're putting stuff up online or you're doing your online service, um, you want to be able to share the the copyright information. That's a song title, the text by the author, things like that. And then make sure you put your your one license uh, number in there. CCLI is very similar to this. Um, but as John will talk about in just a minute, just because you put the stuff on your slides or on your, your, your worship or in your worship materials that you're, you're doing with your, um, with your service, it doesn't necessarily mean that the powers that be um, will uh, not try to flag you for... Um, uh, and William Derby just published a question about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so actually, instead of even putting the slide up, oh, actually, I'll, I'll, I have the, the, the illustration slide you gave me, John, but why don't we go right into that? How do I let streaming uh, services okay. know that I have permission to use copyrighted let material? Me, let me explain it before we look at a slide. Okay. All right. Um, because I don't know that everybody knows what we're talking about. Okay. Fair enough. Um, if you're paying attention these days and you post your stuff on Facebook uh, or YouTube in particular, uh, you will have received a notice at some point that your video has been flagged for a copyright violation. Um, I don't know about other people's experience. My uh, experience with Facebook is it's almost always the History Channel claiming to own a painting from 1632 that they used in some show at some point. Uh, but of course, I got it from the museum and we have the right to use it. Uh, on YouTube, it's almost always music. Uh, and the bots that, that do this automatically uh, apparently can't read. So the fact that you have a proper slide up that says we have the license does not get through to the bot at all. It just hears the tune and it flags it. Uh, and our most frequent issue with them has been that they are flagging public domain tunes probably because somebody down the line did an arrangement that they own or a performance that they own and we're using the original arrangement and our own performance but the bots flag that um th this is kind of a complicated area but i know this is a been a big topic of discussion among pastors about what do we do about this um and and i'll explain what what we're doing what we're doing is Every Sunday night, I sit down and I spend 15 minutes contesting the copyright flags. Um, I think most churches are just ignoring them. And I don't think that's a good idea. Um, on Facebook, what that means is that the History Channel has a button claiming ownership of our video underneath. Uh, and I just don't like that happening in the first place because they don't own any right to it at all. Uh, on YouTube, if you're flagged for a copyright violation, what it means initially is that you can't monetize your video. I don't know any churches that are monetizing. That would be where you can run advertising and charge for advertisement. Um, I, I don't know, is there anybody out there that's doing that? I, I don't think most of us have the volume to, to be able to do that. So you can't monetize. Um, and most of the pastors are saying, well, we're not doing that anyway, so what does it matter? Um, the reason I spend the time to contest each one of these is because that is simply this week's policy at YouTube, and that policy could change next week. Um, they have some pressure from the big um, uh, copyright holders, uh, uh, UMG and so on, that, that are often flagging these things to increase the penalty and either to blank your video out or to, um, you know, give you strikes that will eventually get you removed. So I don't know where that's going to go. So I would prefer to have a long string of successful, su successfully contested copyright claims that have been released than have a long string where I ignored it as a pastor and then they changed the policy and all of a sudden we're not able to, to webcast anymore. 
Um, so we do have a couple of slides that YouTube probably would be the best one to show. Uh, so what you have to do, frankly, is you have to keep records of where you got all this stuff. So anytime you use, uh, we use a lot of classical artwork uh, that'll go up during the sermon or it's used as illustrations. I get them either, um, I make sure that I get them either from Wikimedia and I document where I got them from or many museums now are providing free access uh, and, and free usage of their paintings. It used to be that the photographer owned the right to that picture and you couldn't use it without paying the photographer. But um, now a lot of museums are letting, letting you use this stuff. So we make sure that we've documented everyone that we use and where we got it from. So when, in this case, when uh, the Jonah story came up uh, uh, a few weeks ago, um, if you look on the, dis the dispute claim with the Jonah picture, you see the History Channel claimed that they owned that. Well, it, it, uh, I just responded with the, the uh, details of painting Jonah and the whale was Peter, painted by Peter Lastman, dates from 1621 and is in the public domain. Here's where we got it. That then gets reviewed by a human being who says, oh, well, yeah, duh. And they accept the thing. They take the button off of off, uh, the History Channel button off your video. On the right side is uh, YouTube. As I said, YouTube is, is most often music. And here we were uh, flagged for, um, oh gosh, what was the tune? They don't list the tune. Uh, well, I'm not going to go off my memory, but it was a public domain tune that uh, Douglas Wrights used in him for him. Uh, and they flagged it apparently because somebody else had had done an arrangement of that. Um, so we simply said, look, we use the original arrangement, here's the date and our performance, and they accept that. And then uh, then that, that gets turned off. So uh, it is very tedious. Uh, like I said, it takes, it's not a huge amount of time. It's like 15 minutes every Sunday night that I do this, but it will give us the track record of having had successful contest contests rather than just we ignored it. Um, do not, do not contest uh, something unless you're absolutely right and you have the records to back it up. Because there's where you get into trouble with YouTube right now. If you have, if you contest one of these and you clearly did not have the right, they will file a copyright strike against you. And three strikes, you're out. They, you're off YouTube permanently. Um, so there are big consequences to, to claiming to have the copyright or the, the legitimate usage when you really don't. So be very careful not to contest something that you maybe shouldn't have used. I'd, I'd like to ask if there are any questions about that topic right now, because I know a number of people have gotten in touch with me separately about this. We can come back around to that later if there are more questions. Okay. All right. Um, so um, before we hop into the questions, let me just share a couple more pieces and then we'll, we'll start taking some of the questions that we had from folks. Uh, where can I find out more information about copyright? Because um, while John, Gwen and I are, you know, always an email away, there's lots of places you can find uh, information on this. First of all, um, check out moravian.org. Um, again, we have public domain hymns and liturgies from the Book of Worship and from other sources. We have a chart on the on um, uh, the website right now that lists the CCLI and one license license um, uh, numbers for uh, the copyrighted hymns within uh, the Book of Worship. So I invite you to take a look at that and take a quick read of the guidelines for use of copyrighted materials. It's been around for for about a dozen years now, but it spells out in pretty good detail why you want to be able to uh, make sure that you're you're following the copyright rules and it's the it's the it's the policy of the church um so it, it lays it out uh something like that noah and and the music foundation and the pecs wrote that uh several years ago um and it's a good a really good resource on uh on copyright um and i didn't realize that these were going to show up blue on my powerpoint presentation you really can't see them but um uh, these will be in a a handout that we're working on to to get to you shortly um Check out uh, onelicense.net. 
ccli.com, two things that we looked at earlier today. Uh, Christian Copyright Solutions is another website that you can check out that does some great work uh, in understanding this. There's a, a, a piece that, and let me see if I can click on this, if I can bring this up and just show you that. Let me switch the screen that I'm, I'm looking at here. Uh, and then we'll share that screen. Doo, 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 doo. That's my whole music, sorry about that. Um, okay, it's a blog post. Um, uh, the Church Musician Guides to Copyright and License. Um, I don't know who Ashley is, but Ashley did some, some um, just some real simple, basic, what kind of license do I need? Where do I find this? How do I do this? Um, isn't there some sort of religious exemption? This is something that we talked about earlier today. How do I get a copyright license? So there's lots of, of, of material available online um, to, to help you sort through and wade through um, the, the, the issues of, of copyright. Um, and then finally, um, some other resources for you. The Music Foundation, that's Gwen and Nolan and, and her, their team. Uh, the IBOC, you can always give us a, a call or an email. We're always we're, we're, we're real close. Um, check out the U.S. Copyright Office. Lots of good information there on copyright. And as John will attest, other pastors and churches that are going through this, you'll find that there are folks that, that are dealing with this week in and week out um, and are also uh, excellent sources for, for information on handling uh, these kinds of things. So um, what I'd like to do now is just hop into some of the questions that we got and let's see if I can find where I put those. Here we go. Um, okay, someone, someone asked, with images and artwork, does the word royalty mean the same thing as copyright? They're not interchangeable. Um, they're not the same. There can be a, 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 an image that uh, is copyrighted, but that they don't take royalties for it. You still have to get permission to use it. Um, so there's a, a site that I use, it's called Unsplash. Um, there's a couple of other ones, it's called Pixabay, a couple of other sites. Um, and they have a ton of images that you can use for free. Um, mm -hmm. They do like that you credit the, the author on them, yeah. but you can use those for free. But royalty and copyright are two different things. Royalty is how they, someone gets paid for something. Yeah. Copyright is, is the ownership of those pieces. Yeah, the, the royalty is the payment that goes to the creator. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but it gets confusing because some things are called are licensed as what's called royalty free. Um, and that means you may pay a one time license and then you can use it forever, which uh, there are some other licensing schemes we don't want to get into needle drop and some others that, you know, are different from that. But um, the uh, yeah, uh, I'd add another uh, domain, uh, another um, source is pexels.com has a huge variety of not only stills but videos uh, pixabay also has videos these days which are permission to, uh, are, uh, you can use uh, often without uh, attributing we always try to put an attribution up right um, but some of them are pretty amazing quality they're usually kind of the 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 not not perfect rejects from a shoot that they didn't didn't want to use in the end product and they put them up there and god bless them because boy i've gotten a lot of mileage out of that stuff yeah i, I have as well with with pixabay one thing you do need to watch is that um while they have on the lower part of the screen they've got the images you can use for free on the upper part of the screen yeah. they have uh ads for shutterstock which is yeah. stuff that you pay for um so but again good good resources for that kind of stuff um uh, someone asked, do we have an accessible list of what is in the public domain for the hymnal? Yes, as I mentioned before, and actually I think I have that as a as a something we can take a look at here. Let's see if I've got that up and running here. Yes, so let me just share that screen real quick. Um, what we've done is um, we've gone through the Book of Worship in terms of both, the, uh, it's really small, so I can zoom in a little bit on it. Um, we've gone through the Book of Worship, and so we're during our, in our liturgies or in our hymns, you can, you can say, okay, say I want to use, um, let's see, let's find a good hymn to, to talk about here. Okay, say I want to use hymn number 314 in this temple, no, wrong one, 315, uh, when John baptized by Jordan's River. Um, we know that that's copyrighted by Hope Publishing, and if you have a CCLI license right here, that's the number that you'd be able to use. So we've tried to be able to show what's public domain um, and what is copyright. We're still, this list, we still find that every once in a while we get either some updated information, because if you look over here, we also have information from uh, one license as well, um, so that you can find if no matter which license you've got. But if you look at this set right through here, you know all these great Christmas hymns are all public domain. So uh, there, so there is this list available. It's on Moravian.org, um, and you can find it there. And they've um, all been recorded, Mike. 
Yes, and uh, and and I, I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I do invite you to go and check out. Um, we have a, a new page on Moravian.org, uh, essentially bringing together Lenten resources. Um, and the, the hymns that we've been recording recently um, are all up there now. Uh, we also have someone building uh, lyric videos for those uh, that you will be able to use. Again, all free for, for Moravian congregations to be able to use. Um, someone asked, is Zoom the same as YouTube and Facebook? Um, for, in, for this conversation, Yes. Yes. Um, any any of those kinds of things. Yes, that is that is uh, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. Thing. And um, yeah, the law uh, defines a podcast license and podcast is the term they use to cover all of this, um, which is, you know, I mean, already outdated. But there's a lot of copyright law that is very outdated language. But uh, the podcast is the streaming license and it's all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we had a question as to whether or not um, copyrighted music could be used for a small Zoom Bible study of six to ten people. And the answer is no, not without a license. Um, and this uh, actually was, uh, this topic actually went to the Supreme Court over the question of what constitutes a home showing for videos. Uh, and, and the Supreme Court basically said home showing is going to be your family, maybe a friend or a guest, but it is not going to be we're pretending to be family. Uh, and it's not going to be, oh, I invited all the youth group over to the parsonage and I'm saying it's a home showing. Uh, they don't like pretending. Uh, so no, any unrelated group of people, you have to have a license. Exactly it. Um, and, and someone also asked a question about Google Classroom, same kind of thing, Google yeah. Hangout, all, if you're putting it online, it's essentially the same kind of things you need to make. And that's what, that, you know, read, read the, the fine print when you look for CCLI or one license to make sure that that, that that is indeed covered. But for the most part, they, they translate pretty much anything you're putting online. Um, that's that we also had another 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 question is if there are songs that 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 um, you can't find on CCLI or, or one license um, and or something that you've been doing for years and you have no idea where it came from. Um, while those are fun to use and fun to stream, you really need to do your research and find out where they came from. It could well be that something that you're that you've been using for years was written by someone who is glad to let you use it, but mm -hmm. you need to find you need to find that out. I actually um, have this question. I had that yep. question recently uh, from someone who was, uh, yeah, who, who wanted to use a camp song <laughs> that that she thought was in the public domain. And I did, uh, it only took about half an hour, but I did actually find the originator of that song. And lo and behold, it was written by somebody in 1972. And um, I know that's before a lot of people's time. It is not before mine. And that person is still around and still owns a copyright. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, just have to do some digging. Right, right. Um, does license information, numbers, and things like that need to appear on every item, or can they be included at the beginning of the end of the service? Um, again, that's that you need to see um, the the because all of the the licensing groups have their own way of doing it. Um, some prefer you to put it on each piece that you do. Some will let you put it at the beginning or the end. Um, so it really depends on which service you're using. Um, they also asked, is it okay to adapt a uh, book of worship liturgies by replacing some hymns with public domain hymns? From where I sit, do it. You know, um, it, it opens up opportunities for, for creative use. It also opens up opportunities for, um, you know, uh, making it more relevant to the, the service that you're doing there. So if you want to find, in fact, we're actually looking at doing some of this, um, trying to find uh, liturgies that have copyrighted pieces in them and finding pieces that, that work with them um, that, uh, that make it so that they, they don't have to be licensed and that they're in the public domain. Gwen, it looks like you wanted to add something too to that. Nope, okay, all right, sounds good. Um, okay, I'm trying to see if we've got other questions here. We have one here from Candace. What would happen if anyone reads a copyrighted printed material in an online service? Example, a printed devotional such as our Daily Bread or the Moravian Daily Texts, a published article from a newspaper or magazine, a published book from someone. So as long as you're not reading the whole thing, you know, that, but, but you, you have to think about why you'd want to do that. If you're using it as part of a sermon, um, and John, you, you wanted to talk about sermons, so I want to make sure that 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 we yes. we, we remember that. Yeah, we remember that. that. So, yeah, there there's 
there's something called fair use, um, which um, I often say there's no such thing as fair use. If it's copyrighted, it's copyrighted. Um, uh, if you're using it as an illustration, as long as you say where who who was using it, and where it was coming from, um, you're you're pretty much okay. Uh, if you're talking about the daily text, um, you have our permission to share. That. I hope that you're sharing them at the beginning of every every service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the Sunday daily text, so things like that. Um, but well, we had uh, just uh, we had an we had a case that came up in, a number of years ago when Facebook was fairly new. Okay. Um, and the, uh, the deal that they had negotiated with the NRSD for usage in the daily text did not cover anything on the internet because who'd thought about that? Uh, and at that point, you know, reposting that on, on the web was not covered by copyright, so it was a violation. Um, in terms of sermons, yeah, if you quote somebody and you say who you quoted, that's fair use. Beyond that, be very, very cautious. There are all kinds of pastors, uh, and I'm, I'm, I deal a lot with pastors, and they all think that they're, you know, jailhouse lawyers on this stuff. Uh, fair use is very, very restricted and quite specific. Uh, even if you're uh, in a college, um, there are limitations to fair use that you have to observe. And so, if you don't know those limitations, don't assume it's fair, fair use. The other thing related to sermons that comes up uh, a lot that I think most pastors do not know is that under copyright law, your Sunday sermon is copyrighted by the church or the denomination, not you, uh, unless you have a specific agreement with the congregation or the denomination that you own the copyright to your sermons. Um, that doesn't seem to make sense to most of us, but uh, that is actually how the law works. Um, so I know there are a couple denominations that have actually set a policy allowing the uh, pastors to own copyright to their own sermons, but I don't think we've done anything in the Moravian Church regarding that. So maybe at the next synod we should bring that up. All right, I think we've worked through all the questions that are here in the chat. I'd like to open it up now if anyone has questions um, that they'd like to get answered um, while we're here. Don't everybody chime in at once. Maybe. We must have done a really good job, guys. I have I have a question. Just okay, Carol. On what John just said. So if I if I wrote an original story and gave that as a sermon. And let's say I've written a bunch of those kinds of stories and I want to have them published. I have to get permission from the Moravian church. Or for, for, from your congregation. Or from the, the way congregation. the law works is that they define that as work for hire. And pastors are a really strange entity as far as uh, several aspects of tax okay. law and so on are, but they define it as work for hire. I don't think most congregations care about this, so it's pretty easy to go to your board and ask them to write a letter saying you own the copyright. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it would devolve to the person who was, to the entity that was paying you when you wrote it. Okay. Interesting. No, I think it's a pain in the butt. I do too. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, so just a question. Actually, Sam just asked it in the chat, um, the similar question, like, so uh, the average attendance, would that be in-person pre-COVID, in-person yeah. now, or virtual views? Like, how do we do and track attendance for these things given, like, like we had 500 views on a sermon, or, or service a few weeks ago, and that was just people clicking on it for 20 seconds. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Normally, it's like 60 to 100. So how do we track that? Um, th this question even came, uh, came up for our annual reports, but it, it takes on added life when it's going to affect the, the price of your license. Um, the, uh, for, uh, I, in our case, for our annual report uh, thing, we uh, track only people who stayed with uh, the, the webcast for more than a minute. I would really like to have actual stats of those who got at least halfway through. Um, uh, but yes, because you have this huge number, uh, especially on Facebook, of people who kind of scrolled by and the video started and they watched two and a half seconds of it. Uh, that, you know, that's like somebody walked by the church building. Um, so there, there, uh, 
I think we only need to count people who really stuck through the whole thing or a substantial part of it. Um, uh, this is all a gray area that you know hasn't been defined. Uh, the, all the licenses are really set up for how many people had a butt in a pew on Sundays, uh, and they haven't changed that. So, that's so then in theory, we can all have the lowest number now since you know COVID. <laughs> when I <laughs> joking facetious for the recording, that was a joke. <laughs> Probably, um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I wore a black and white jacket today for a reason because to me, copyright is black and white, not too much gray. And, and John just said that that's a great gray area. I, I only have gray up here. But anyway, um, the um, I, for, for safety purposes, I would probably stick with pre-COVID numbers. I mean, unless there's a substantial drop. Right. Yeah, uh, uh, this is a this is a temporary aberration this year. Uh, we all wish it wasn't still going on, but it is a temporary aberration. Uh, and like I said, the, the, the way the licenses are set up is really physical attendance and pews and they didn't change any of that. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't go out there and especially use that number of drive bys that saw a half a second of your video on Facebook. That would be silly. And I think the licensed people would say it's silly too. They understand that issue. Megan, you had a question? Yes, uh, I had submitted it in the chat. Um, what about when you are particularly printing something, you're enlarging it for people with disabilities. I have been told by a disability lawyer that that does not violate copyright. Yes, but I don't know if that's actually true. That, but only for those people. In other words, you cannot, you can't blow it up for everybody, right? And and project it or something. You can blow it up for those individuals. And yes, that is not a, a violation of copyright law because of ADA. Thanks, John. Any other questions? All right. Well, like, would uh, it be worth doing another like three months from now? <laughs> copyright things as things continue to change and evolve and adapt. Yes. Like, yeah. This is this is actually the third third one of these that I've done. Uh, <laughs> so and and you know I I I, uh, I realized I was wearing the same shirt and one I did back this time <laughs> last year. Um, it's the only that's, shirt he has. That's that's, that's it. <laughs> you know the 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 one of the great things about working from home uh, is that. Uh, my wardrobe, I haven't, I haven't really bought clothes in a year because I haven't really had to, had to do that. But, but no, we, we know that, that things are changing and we know that, that, you know, within the next, we, I shouldn't say no, we hope and pray that within the next six months, we're back together in our churches or in, in some form. But we, I've also heard from a lot of our pastors, a lot of our congregations that they're going to continue to stream. Yes. They're going to continue because we're, it's, it's a new way of reaching out to folks. It's a wonderful way to bring folks. And one thing I love is, is on a Sunday morning, I can, I can worship wherever I want to around the country. It's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, we know that. And, and we also realize that the, the licensing companies are looking at changing things every day. They're all yeah. looking at ways to yeah. make all of this work because we're all, we're, Again, if you told me this time, well, actually, this time last year, I probably would have said, yeah, maybe that's the case. If you told me this time, you know, January of last year, that all of our churches would be streaming something or doing something online, I yeah. would have said, oh, you've got to be, you've got to yeah. be kidding me. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I've been, I've been, I mean, really pleasantly surprised by by how folks have grasped this and really uh, made it their own. Actually, John and I will be doing a, a session next week uh, that talks about, you know, making your your online service look that much better. Um, things, simple things to, to, to work on. But we know copyright is, a, as John put it, a pain in the butt. It really, yeah. really is. Um, and it's something that, you know, from the publishing side, you know, we, I publish books with the IBFC. We publish the magazine. I know the copyright side from this side. It's this, this whole new, uh, new avenue that we have to focus on yeah. to be able to make this stuff work. The one thing I will say, though, is, is it's worth taking the time to understand it and to follow it. Because yeah. if you don't, there are 
definitely repercussions. Uh, let me let me chime in on that. First, first, this ties in to the why we're doing this uh, this leadership series is the question. You know, how are we going to hybridize all this going forward? So, I mean, that's the, that's our big topic. Um, but something I didn't say, and I don't think anybody did say that I ought to be said, is um, if you are in violation of these laws, yes, the chances are you're going to get away with it. Uh, the, usually what happens is one of the big players decides to make an example of someone. This is what happened with uh, uh, Disney and showing DVDs in church. They picked some churches and made examples of them and nearly bankrupted them. Uh, they have lots of money. And when they're focused on making an example, they can pour a lot of money into it. If your congregation happens to be the one that attracts somebody's attention, that lawsuit will not just be for your local congregation, but it will go upstream to the province, which is where the money is. And it, so I, I have to ask the right, do you have the right to be sloppy with this and endanger you know, the province, uh, and your congregation uh, on these issues. Um, you know, I think we need to do what's right uh, because we're Christians and we're called to do that. And even if we disagree with the law, we still need to abide by the law. Mm -hmm. And John, based with that, I, I, I will share this. Uh, this is actually from the Moravian Church Guidelines for Use of Copyrighted Material. Um, you know, the copyright laws of the U.S. and Canada protect musical compositions, written prayers, sermons, poems, hymns, and song lyrics, liturgies, videos, websites, and software. Our commitment to Christ calls us to respect the rights of others as well as the law of the land. So mm -hmm. it's um, written there. I was going to say in black and white, but it's actually in white and blue and yellow. But it's, it's, it's right there. It's right there. Um, so um, again, it's, it's, uh, yes, it is a difficult um, thing to try to... to, to and we hope that that our conversation today has helped. Um, and, you know, we'd love to hear from folks. Again, we're all, um, at least I'll offer for myself, I can't offer for Gwen and John, but if you've got questions about copyright, by all means, um, shoot us a note, we'll help however we can. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna boil down what we talked about today into a two-sheeter that will, you know, give you all of the sort of the questions and answers we wanted to hold off until we finished today uh, to be able to put that together for you. Um, but we'll share that chart um, that shows, you know, uh, what you need to do for which different piece, um, along with resources uh, for you to go and find information on on copyright. Um, so if there, are, if I I'll, again, we have uh, three more minutes before we're done. Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, would be happy to entertain them now. I, I, I wonder have... if it's. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Candace. Oh, hey, yes. Um, I do have a question. What would happen if um, somebody wanted to change the lyrics of a copyrighted hymn? Like the one example I'm thinking of is the Presbyterian Church USA um, wanted to change some of the lyrics of In Christ Alone by Keith and Kristen Getty um, before they included it in their new hymnal in 2013. But somehow the, the songwriters found out about it and they said no, so that they just decided not to include it in the hymnal. How how is that like? What happens if if song lyrics song lyrics get changed and the church comes under fire for it? You you can't legally change the lyrics of something without checking with the without getting permission from the creator. That goes back to one of the early screens yeah. that Mike had of that the creator is the only person who has who has that right. And so, the, have to go. That, that that Gwen is right. Uh, the fact is, there are a number of our churches that do that quite freely because they're borrowing, um, they're using um, some of those top forty Christian hymns that have a very Calvinist viewpoint, and they're changing a few words to make it more Moravian. It is technically not legal to do so. Yeah, co essentially, copyright holders. Um, have have five rights. Um, the rights to re reproduce the work, to adapt the work, to distribute the work, to display it publicly, and to perform the work for the public. Adapting is that is that key piece there. 
uh, and they can control who, now you can, you can always ask someone if, if they will let you do that. Um, I have an example of that um, for, for, I think it was the first synod that I attended here um, with the Northern Province. Um, Chris and Tina Giesler um, adapted a song by a band called the Kennedys. They're actually folk musician friends of ours, but they're, they're published, they're, they're recording artists. Um, they asked for permission and, and the Kennedys said, sure, go right ahead, have a ball with it. Um, but they couldn't do that without, without, without asking permission. Um, so that's, you know, if, if, and think about it, if you wrote a song and it meant a lot to you, would yes. you want someone monkeying with your lyrics? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I haven't written a song yet. I have a book that I got by Jeff Tweedy from Wilco. It's called uh, How to Write One Song. And that's all I want to be able to do is write one song because <laughs> um, I haven't been able to do it yet. I'm a guitar player, but I haven't been able to do it yet. Um, but, but again, um, you, have to, you, have to, you have to have to make sure that we respect those folks. Mandy, you had a question too? Yeah, I was just going to say, I wonder if it might be helpful to do another kind of um, Zoom like this where you go through um, the CCLI and one license and all that they all the features that they offer and how they work exactly um, because I know um, I'm really comfortable with CCLI but I just got a one license subscription and I'm not um, mm -hmm. I, it, it does not seem as user friendly to me and it may just be that I don't know what I'm doing yet but it might I'm wondering if it may be helpful yeah. to to do something like this with those platforms with, with just those We'll, we'll talk about it. It's, it's, it's a good idea, Mandy. That is a once, really good idea. Uh, once you get your mind around how it works, it's not that hard. But okay. uh, yeah, it is different a different format. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I just want to say very thank you very, very much. It's been really, really an uh, excellent, well done, and very informative. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you so much to our presenters today. This has been great and wonderful information. Um, for those who had the um, paid registration, we will have all of the recordings from all of the workshops um, within a few weeks of the um, end, which is on March 13th. Um, if you haven't registered for the rest of your workshops, make sure you do that. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm.